thank you all very much for uh, the great welcome this morning and for being here on, uh, I guess, Easter Monday. I was kind of shocked when we were doing this, tra this trip uh, to the region and other places that uh, so much was closed down both last Friday and today. I kind of forgot that outside of the United States, you know, <laughs> people stopped working over this weekend. So it's great to be here and uh, to continue a real, you know, what I felt was a real fruitful line of discussion uh, that started in Port Morrisby with our colleagues in uh, Papua New Guinea about the efforts there, continued through Canberra with our colleagues from Australia, and then here in uh, Hawaii, um, we've been talking to officials from Indopaycom and other organizations that support the work uh, of Indopaycom and that we are trying to accomplish in the region. Um, as uh, Dr. Satu, I say, I hope I pronounce this right. Lemay. I was going to say Lemay. Okay, Lemay mentioned. I'm the uh, principal deputy assistant secretary for the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, and uh, I've been in that position for a little over three years now, and watched it evolve in many different directions and different things, including work in the, this region. We had a couple of main lines of work that we do here, and I'm gonna to touch on one of them, but I'm happy to answer questions on others. Uh, the main line of work we're doing right now is pursuing the implementation of the Global Fragility Act, especially in Papua New Guinea. And I'll give some more remarks on that. But another line of effort that's very important to our efforts in this region is on atrocity prevention and atrocity response work, uh, especially with regards to Myanmar and to China. And so uh, we are working closely with colleagues back in Washington to try to address those situations too. So if there's questions that I can answer on that, I'd be happy to take that. Now I know the East-West uh, Center has a strong legacy of spanning more than six decades of bringing others together uh, to address the challenges here in the Indo-Pacific region. And I'm excited to be here to continue that collaboration on behalf of my bureau um, with all of you here today. So a lot has changed since the last time CSO came to the East-West Center, which was, I think, my previous assistant secretary, Denise Natali, in 2019. Uh, primarily, we faced the impact of COVID-19, which really put, slowed down so much of our regional efforts and our ability to get out and do field work. Um, it was quite striking. You know, the wheels kept churning in Washington, but frankly, the traction in the field was slowed down and, um, and not neglected, but there, there was a lot that had to be done. And I am excited right now to see that things are picking up again. And I hope this is the first of many visits that you'll have from the State Department uh, as we face you know, all the whole variety of issues that we're facing here. The, um, we are focused on you know, currently addressing the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are looking at climate crisis, and um, we are really concerned in this region, especially, about the resurgence and emboldening of autocrats and the backsliding of democracy. And so it's against that kind of backdrop, um, which the president has identified as really an inflection point right now in the history, that there has been a strong decision out of Washington that the United States has to get back and lead. And to address that and other looming challenges to peace and stability, um, we have evolved our policies and our uh, practices on conflict prevention and stabilization in many ways, uh, basically thanks to the contributions and experience and commitment of stakeholders like you. Uh, we have been in a listening mode for the last couple of years and trying to adjust what we're doing. Um, one of the key elements in all of this is what I mentioned earlier, the Global Fragility Act. This was an act that was passed in 2019 uh, with strong bipartisan support, and it still retains strong bipartisan support. Since its passage, we developed the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, which came out a year later. And in just the last few weeks, we had a decision that we notified the Congress on the priority countries for implementation of that strategy. Um, this, I have to say, is a huge development 
for the work that my bureau is doing and for, the, I believe, the U.S. government in general. It comes after kind of a stock taking of past stabilization efforts, and we can talk about that more. But I, I have to emphasize um, the Global Fragility Act and our approach to it is really informed by failure. And there was a recognized failure of what happened in Afghanistan particularly, but also Iraq, in terms of stabilization efforts. And how can we do better? Um, I don't know if many of you read, or if any of you read, the Cigar Reports, the Special Investigator General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. But they came out with a very strong report last August. It was the 20th report. And it focused on 20 years of stabilization efforts in Afghanistan and basically posed a series of questions about why they did not succeed. Why did we end up with the policy outcome that we ended up with? And frankly, what we're trying to do now in CSO, um, working with all our partners in the US government, is answer those questions to try to find a better way forward in doing stabilization wherever we decide we need to put those efforts. And that's why we now have these five priority countries or four countries in a region in which we're going to apply our efforts under the Global Fragility Act. Those uh, regions or countries, I'm sure you're aware, are, I'm gonna, I have the list here, Haiti, Libya, Mozambique, Papua New Guinea, and the grouping of five coastal West African countries, um, including Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guinea, and Togo. Now, they are all very different. They all are facing very different kinds of questions of instability. Um, but we thought this was important to allow us to try the different elements to kind of stress test the Global Fragility Act in a lot of different places and draw lessons from those stress tests that would have application in other places around the world. So this process that we're launching into now, this 10-year process, is meant not only to address those countries, but to draw more broader or more universal kind of lessons learned that will have application in other places and help us do better in terms of the work we're trying to do for the US government. We, will, we are working in depth in every country and subregion with the objective to improve the understanding of how the United States can best team with partners in these challenging settings. And as I said before, then draw the lessons uh, to better prevent conflict elsewhere as well. We're, uh, we'll partner with these countries and regions and we're guided as we partner with them by a few key principles. First, we will work collaboratively with government and civic partners in an integrated approach. Secondly, we will utilize development, diplomacy, and security sector programs and means in a coordinated manner in order to foster an enabling environment and solidify progress and provide new tools and insights to strengthen democratic institutions and promote human rights, gender equity, and equality. And finally, we will adapt to and learn from the changing conditions that we encounter, anchoring our efforts in local communities. So in Papua New Guinea, our engagement will strengthen our partnerships across the Indo-Pacific region um, as it geographically links the Southeast Asia area with Oceania. Papua New Guinea is among the most populous, diverse, and resource-rich Pacific Island countries, and it expires, aspires excuse me, to be a stronger democratic leader in the Pacific. We want to be responsive to these aspirations and to these efforts and are working to expand our efforts through the embassy there. We see unique opportunities in Papua New Guinea. Um, it is a nation that strategically links Southeast Asia to the South Pacific. We will focus on, greater, on a greater civic role for women and greater community engagement for peace building. Um, we will seek to alleviate intertribal tensions and to promote reconciliation all against the backdrop uh, of addressing some of the greater challenges, including east-west competition, climate change, uh, natural disaster, the pandemic, and that sort of thing. Now, we're in the process now of developing 
a 10-year implementation plan to implement the strategy in this country. The 10-year plan will be developed to emphasize locally driven solutions. Um, with a, it has a long-term vision and will involve continuous monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Now on the locally driven solutions, the idea is we should be partnering with not just the federal or national governments, but provincial as well as local governments, as well as civil society, businesses, and anyone else can help us define what is the challenges that we need to, def to address locally, and then help us work together to see how we can best support the response to those challenges. This is not the United States coming in and saying, you have a problem that we have identified, and here is a solution that we've identified for your problem. We're stepping back from that and trying to tr different approach to kind of build this from the base up versus from the top down. Um, the each, excuse me, uh, collaboration in each of these countries will be different and it'll be tailored to the unique circumstances we find in each country or region, um, reflecting the capabilities and voices of the local actors that we're engaging. By focusing on locally driven efforts and context specific solutions, the strategy, the implementation of the strategy is adaptable against emerging threats, we believe, and also allows us to identify opportunities that we might otherwise miss. It will take into account the dynamic nature of these environments so that we can change course accordingly. Now, one of the things we have to do, we'll have these 10-year implementation plans. We're developing the frameworks for them now. Uh, we hope to have that done by May. And then by September, a 10-year plan, which is quite ambitious and quite a lot of work. But it is not supposed to be static. We have a 10-year plan. We'll report it to Congress. We'll engage with Congress about why that we think this makes the most sense, et cetera take back their feedback, which they always like to give on these sorts of things, and then follow it. We'll see what happens. Every two years after that, we have to do a report to Congress, kind of giving ourselves a scorecard. What do we think has succeeded? What hasn't? Why? What should we be doing differently? And adjusting accordingly. So the 10-year plan that we come up with in the September might, look like, might not look like anything similar to what we end up with 10 years from now. And that's by design. And in talking to members of the Hill, you know, with the House and for the Senate, they've told us they want us to try different things. They want laboratories of experiment out there. They want us to succeed, but they also want us to have failure, which is really also quite a different approach than anything we've tried to do before. And it'll be interesting to see how the U.S. government as a bureaucracy responds to that, quite frankly. That's also a challenge. Nobody wants to be there and say, hey, we tried something, it didn't work, oh well. You know, it's uh, quite an important step forward. Now, Congress has authorized $200 million a year for this effort. Uh, this year, fiscal year, which ends at the end of September, they appropriated a little over $100 million that we are currently developing also spend plans for to just kind of start the process but I think we'll have a more accurate idea of what the different costs will be in each country as once we have our 10-year plan in place. And we'll be able to go back to the Hill and tell them this is what we need, and they promise that they would support us. So we'll see. This doesn't mean that, that money will be to the exclusion of other money that's already being spent in that country. If there are other programs already going on, they're to be integrated under the umbrella of our implementation plan but not to be excluded or say, oh, well, you do that, we can't do it anymore, that sort of thing. It's all to be integrated under this general policy objective we're trying to achieve there. Um, this means that we'll be tapping into, we think, the expansive expertise and resources that reside in the U.S. government. We'll be sharpening and updating the tools that people use where needed, and then humbly applying the hard lessons um, from the past transforming the way we work with each other within the U.S. government. Working with local governments and civil society in the private sector, we believe the strategy's implementation offers an opportunity to improve the way we engage in challenging environments and jointly build resilience against political, economic, and natural shocks. 
The strategy <coughs> excuse me, will elevate our shared priorities of democracy promotion, good governance, respect for human rights, the advancement of gender equality, the countering of corruption, the reduction of the risk of climate change, and addressing, as I said before, the global pandemic that we're engaged in. One of the chief tenets of the Global Fragility Act, which is woven into the strategy, is the imperative of partnering also with the international community. This is not the United States going it alone. We are talking to our bilateral partners who are active in these countries, as well as multilateral partners and other regional organizations and global institutions. This is, uh, th there's been a huge emphasis placed on this, again, because of the feeling that somehow the United States had isolated itself from like-minded countries who could do the same sort of work. We also want to make sure that we are not duplicating efforts, overlapping with other efforts, or even crossing lines with other efforts. If we all are moving towards the same objective, the United States doesn't have to do it. Somebody else can do it. That's, that kind of burden sharing would be welcome under our efforts under the Global Fragility Act. So we are um, keen to begin now kind of more in-depth discussions of the lessons learned. Um, from the East-West Center, we'd love to hear what you're thinking of in terms of what we should be thinking about in, for Papua New Guinea. What are your recommendations for what we should be doing there? And where you think we can best align and coordinate efforts, um, especially, uh, you know, in the, the region around Papua New Guinea. The strategy calls also for inclusive processes, and calls for continuous dialogue and consultations at the local level to provide a foundation for the locally driven stabilization and conflict prevention efforts. So we will seek to do all of this while strengthening the national governments and our relations with the national governments and the democratic institutions that are there. The strategy, the strategy prioritizes both the local and long term as we move forward together. So let me just sum up, because I've already gone, I think, too long. Um, but this is a new way. The strategy provides a new way to address an old problem. It acknowledges and addresses some of the most persistent criticism of U.S. foreign policy in recent years. Um, by providing a 10-year kind of horizon for this work, we will hopefully address the criticism that the United States government often has a lack of coherent and comprehensive overall strategy for where we're working for countries or regions um, emerging from conflict or destabilizing kind of situations. Uh, the strategy, I think, will be a collaborative effort tailored to the context and capabilities and constraints of our partners. We plan to work together to look beyond the urgent crisis and near-term needs to focus on mutually agreed strategic goals and objectives uh, in the 10-year horizon. This is going to take commitment, innovative thinking, and most importantly, strategic patience. And in each country, we believe we'll gain a nuanced perspective on how the United States can team with and partner um, to, to address the challenge settings that we're, we'll be emerging. Although this is a 10-year plan, as I mentioned, it's going to be reviewed at least every two years in a formal way as a regular reviews with our partners um, and folks on the ground to assess how we're doing, and help us refine our work. Um, so we think this strategy has implications beyond just these five countries or four countries in the region involved, and will start to shape U.S. foreign policy for the future. Now, President Biden, when he released these countries, he put out a statement and a prologue to the strategy and basically said, prevention is hard work. It is measured not in days and weeks, but in years and generations. Now, this is especially true, I think, on the work we're going to be doing under this act. The, um, it's always easy uh, to kind of criticize the failures that occur, and it's always hard to identify the successes in this kind of work. But we hope to be able to provide measurable success 
that people will understand so that we can show this is in the U.S. national interest to promote this form of stability among these kinds of countries uh, so that in the long run we will improve the situation for America and its partners around the world. So let me leave it there. Um, be happy to engage in discussion, answer any questions about this. And as I said, any other items I hope I can touch on. I will admit, um, if you saw my biography, uh, you know, my specialty is more West than East. Um, but uh, having worked now on these issues for a while, I think I have some insights that might be helpful or could at least tell you what other people are talking about back in Washington. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention.